Allora, ben trovati. Ok, bene, bentornati in questo nuovo appuntamento di From Home to Space organizzato da Missione Statunitense USA in Italia, come usiamo dire appunto in Italia, e l'Agenzia Spaziale Italiana, un'iniziativa della Missione Diplomatica Statunitense in Italia, dell'Agenzia Spaziale Italiana. Siamo passati da due incontri a settimana a un incontro a settimana perché è un dato positivo, la vita è ancora molto complicata, dobbiamo rimanere sempre a casa, però è anche vero che qualche cosa, almeno qui in Italia, eh, si sta eh, muovendo per tornare a una pseudo normalità e quindi eh, come dire, le occasioni degli appuntamenti vanno anche regolati con il resto delle nostre attività quotidiane e con un aspetto anche molto positivo che iniziative come le, quella appunto avviata con la missione diplomatica statunitense che all'inizio era eh, appunto una delle poche, oggi viene eh, moltiplicata da tante altre iniziative su tanti altri settori e questo ne siamo contenti di essere stati tra i primi ma anche eh, di esserci ancora. Oggi un eh, ospite molto particolare viene da un uh, istituto di studi tra i più importanti al mondo che è il MIT di Boston, è un, un mito diciamo, per quanto riguarda la ricerca. Ad introdurlo però sarà la nostra ospite di oggi e delle altre occasioni, Marlin Nice, che saluto chiaramente e a cui do la parola per avviare questa conferenza in diretta con gli Stati Uniti e anche un pezzetto di Milano. Ve lo dirà Marlin Nice. Buonasera, buonasera a tutti e grazie Francesco. And now, as we promised, <clears throat> we're going to continue the program in English. So we're really happy to continue this series from home to space with the Italian Space Agency and some other partners in America. Today we have a really special guest, another special guest I should say, because we've had some great guests as well. Um, her name is Professor Daniela Wood. And she's going to bring some other special guests with her from a project she's working on. But let me tell you just a little bit about Professor Wood. Professor Daniela Wood serves as an assistant professor in media, arts, and sciences, and holds a joint appointment in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You know it as MIT. Within the MIT Media Lab, Professor Wood leads the Space Enabled Research Group. She is a scholar of societal development with a background that includes satellite design, earth science, applications, systems engineering, and technology policy. In her research, Professor Wood designs innovative systems that harness space and technology to address development challenges around the world. Her previous positions have been at NASA headquarters, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Aerospace Corporation, Johns Hopkins University, and the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs. She has a PhD in engineering systems from MIT and also holds degrees in aeronautic and astronautics, technology policy, aerospace engineering. That's a huge resume. I want to remind everyone that Professor Wood will give a presentation. And during her presentation, you're welcome to start submitting questions via chat on YouTube. And afterwards, I'll be back to help moderate the questions. And for now, I'm going to turn over the, the program to Professor Wood. Hello, it is a pleasure to greet all of you. And thank you so much to the team uh, based in the US embassy and consulates in Italy, as well as the Italian Space Agency for inviting me. I have been so thankful for hospitality on many days uh, from this team, whether visiting Italy in 2018 or also collaborating with the Italian Space Agency to give presentations at international space conferences. So we continue, even as we are working from home, to share our work together. 
I will just take a moment and set up my slides. Hopefully it will be easy for everyone to see the presentation. Thanks so much. I am speaking today about the topic of sustainability in Earth and in space. And the idea here is to think about what we have to do using technology and policy and social science to make progress for a sustainable world is also a world that's just and safe for people from all backgrounds. I want to highlight that in a few moments, I'll introduce a collaborator, one of the professors at Politecnico di Milano. And I was so thankful to meet Professor Camila Colombo and several of her students by the connections made by the US Embassy and Consulate in Italy. So we are celebrating that about two years ago, I was introduced to this team at Politecnico di Milano. I visited and gave a presentation, and now we have opportunities to collaborate where our students and students from the Politecnico are working together. So we'll share more about that in a moment. Let me first introduce the Space Enabled Research Group at MIT's Media Lab. We focus on asking, how can we advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space? This means we want to see a world where everyone can use space technology to help address their local concerns. But we also want to see a world where we are living in a way that is sustainable in terms of uh, economic justice, environmental justice, and social justice. One way to describe this world is the future we are trying to plan from the point of view of the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals are a series of visions set forth by the United Nations, and they give us a sense for what we want to see the world look like uh, in a future where we have a more safe environment, both physically but also economically, and ensuring everyone has access to food and uh, safe access to healthcare. This is a vision that we share, and part of our goal is to ask, how can technology from space contribute to the sustainable development goals? There are a number of ways that we use technology from space to understand how our planet is changing and how it affects the lives of people around the world. Of course, we've used data both from satellites and from other kinds of sensors on the ground to have a long record of temperature. And we understand that the planet is warming due to human impact and that we need to continue to understand the impacts of this climate change on the lives of people, especially those living in small island nations, coastal ecosystems, as well as those living in the Arctic regions. They are especially affected. We can also think about the fact that our economic system creates a large amount of carbon dioxide as waste and other greenhouse gases. We also use satellites to understand these patterns. And we need to think about what kind of changes we can make to our global economic system to reduce this kind of waste. Meanwhile, even above the Earth's atmosphere, we are also creating unsustainable waste. And it's also a, a situation in which we see uh, harmed countries that are new to space technology because many uh, activities have been done in space already and it creates uh, space debris that is not sustainable. I even want to ask the question, what will humans do when we live in places like the moon and Mars in the future? Can we find ways to live as humans and communities in these new places, but to be more sustainable, to be thinking more about circular economies where we are not creating as much waste and we're also creating socially and economically just societies. We can learn about that both in space and on Earth. Meanwhile, we see countries around the world adopting technology from space and becoming more active. And I work a lot with leaders from Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia who are creating their own national space activities. Here you see the example of teams in Ghana that are working with an international project called the Square Kilometer Array, and they are training local people to be participating in radio astronomy. And our team, we ask how we can use these six space technologies to help support sustainable development on Earth, but also to contribute to asking how we can make space activity more sustainable in space. And so we are thinking about using satellite Earth observation, satellite positioning, satellite communication. We think about transferring technology from space to other fields. We draw lessons from human space flight and we develop, develop microgravity research experiments. We're also interested in the role of basic scientific research in space as a tool for development. In order to design these tools such that they have the best impact on development goals, we draw from tools such as design, art, social science, data science, satellite engineering, and complex system modeling. I'll show a few examples of those as we continue. We do our work by collaborating with international development organizations, as well as local and regional leaders who are already working on sustainable development goals. And we ask, 
how we can make it easier for them to use space technology. I want to highlight my team and introduce that we come from a variety of fields, including satellite engineering and the others that I showed. And we are thinking always about how to combine these different techniques how to make progress toward applying space technology toward sustainability on Earth as well as in space. In the coming minutes, I'm going to show a few more examples of the work of my team uh, using space technology for sustainability. But I also wanted to pause and introduce Professor Camila Colombo. She'll introduce her research team as well at Polytechnico di Milano, and she'll share a few examples of how we're collaborating. We have found a great opportunity to collaborate, particularly asking uh, how can we use their expertise in the modeling satellite missions and our expertise in the topic of looking at new ways to use materials such as wax for fuel systems for satellites. So her team is helping us do some of the modeling for this. And with that, I'll pass it over to Professor Colombo. Please share your screen as well and show us the work uh, that you are doing with our team as well as your overall research. Thank you, Camila. Okay, uh, just a few words to introduce our uh, work at Polytechnic Milano uh, in Italy, and uh, we will in the Department of uh, Race, Science, and Technology. And actually, thank you to the US Consulate uh, to collaborate with the team uh, Daniel at uh, MIT. Uh, in our uh, uh, we work on a on several project, and the main project is called the Compass, surfing throughout uh, maneuver, uh, perturbation, and uh, uh, analysis. Uh, space is now important for all this is on I can think of the satellite position or uh, telecom Commission or Earth uh, or, uh, monitoring, uh, weather forecast, uh, 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 and the sensing of condition on our planet. If uh, we look at uh, a map on the Earth, we much highlight service on the Earth, use the things that are represented the polls. Imagine to highlighting all the location on the earth using this one be the result the map covered because life really on uh, light uh, based, based on the, that um, that's bring us service also using us to new technology science space exploration uh, our team Technical Milano is in particular how to transfer satellite to operational orbit, how to reach and how to control those orbits so that the service can be ordered on ground. But so on, uh, on another side, how to protect uh, satellite and the activities from uh, which are in base and uh, in particular situation awareness is the field of science that is studying uh, how to protect space activities and earth from asteroids that uh, might impact the earth and uh, space debris so the unused satellite and uh, fragments of spacecraft that are orbiting our planet what is in common between uh, three three different aspects uh, what is in common is uh, uh, the model behind in fact, when you model the orbit of the satellite, you can consider uh, the main effect, the main gravitational force, like the of the Earth or the Sun. But in reality, the model can be much more complex if you consider the effect of all those forces uh, around the main planet, like the effect of solar radiation pressure or the Moon or other planets or aerodynamic drag. The uh, traditional approach is to try to cancel out uh, this effect to counteract it with uh, uh, fuel, with the maneuvers. While the approach of our project 
architect is the one of uh, studying these dynamics in full details and try to leverage uh, the dynamical effect to develop techniques uh, to allow satellite to surf by exploiting uh, this field of natural forces. And this will allow reducing extremely high emission cost, create new opportunities for space exploitation and exploration and uh, mitigating space debris. Uh, this is uh, our main research activity that uh, uh, mix a background of uh, uh, researcher with engineering, uh, optimization, dynamical system theory background, and uh, orbital dynamics, because uh, we study uh, the long-term evolution of orbit through mathematical model. Then, uh, with the very high fidelity models of the physics, uh, we actually um, uh, compare this high fidelity model with the uh, more mathematical and simpler model and uh, in, uh, uh, in this way we can calculate the maneuvers that satellites need to do to move in a different orbit but then exploit this dynamical environment uh, and so that they kind of surf in space and we apply this uh, to many of uh, uh, the field that I described before. And in particular, in relation to uh, the work of uh, Daniel at the MIT, uh, we work as well on uh, space uh, sustainability uh, because there are a lot of debris fragment and uh, satellites that orbit around the Earth and they can damage operational satellites. So we work on modeling this large number of space debris object, calculating uh, maneuvers in order to avoid collision and accident in space, uh, uh, create and design the end of life of this satellite at the end of mission, uh, ca calculate re-entry prediction when they enter into the Earth atmosphere, and uh, harmonize uh, the boom and the evolution of space activities uh, with uh, the future sustainability on space. And uh, uh, last, last uh, we are working on uh, uh, measuring the capacity of this uh, spatial ecosystem, and we are involved in the interagency coordination uh, committee, that is the committee that is trying to ensure the sustainable development of space activities. So uh, let me conclude uh, just uh, uh, briefly introducing the project. We work with uh, Danielle, uh, so the collaboration uh, that was allowed by the uh, US consulate between the Politecnico di Milano and the MIT, uh, where uh, we studied uh, thanks to uh, a master thesis uh, of uh, Daniele that is also participating to this uh, call, uh, we studied the mission analysis of uh, uh, emission for exploring the capabilities of uh, hybrid propulsion satellites uh, in order to cast directly the paraffin wax into uh, annular geometries in microgravity. Uh, so mm, this, uh, uh, this mission will prove uh, in different phases the fact that uh, the wax can be uh, kept in space under the melting temperature by means of orbit and attitude design and passive thermal control. Then when we decide that we want to melt the wax, we will uh, use active thermal control and try to collect this wax uh, into an annual, uh, annular uh, geometry to become uh, propellant and to use it to fire the engine of the satellite in order to deorbit the spacecraft uh, and therefore to use this uh, uh, green fuel uh, uh, strategies to uh, produce the end of life of the satellite. Um, let me just uh, thank the overall uh, uh, team that uh, in a way or in another is uh, inside uh, this and other uh, project and uh, uh, let me pass back uh, the, the word to, to Danielle, thanking again her and the US Consulate for, uh, for our collaboration. Thank you so much, Camila. That was wonderful to see. And thank you for introducing the project that we are collaborating on. And I will continue to share more about that in a few minutes. That was wonderful to have your summary. And it's wonderful that in 2018, uh, she and I exchanged similar discussions to what you just saw. And we thought, what could we do together? And how could our students collaborate? I want to give a special thank you to Daniela Utieri and Marco Brenna, who are the students who volunteered to actually uh, start the collaboration between us. So thank you all. 
I'll give you a few other examples of the projects of Space Enabled, and I will highlight some examples that cover our work on sustainability on Earth, as well as in space. As I continue, you'll see examples of work by all the team members that are highlighted here. The first example is coming from a work we are doing with collaborators in West Africa, especially in the countries of Benin and Ghana. We are collaborating with entrepreneurs, as well as scientists and government teams to ask how we can apply satellite Earth observation to contribute to environmental management. This actually addresses sustainable development goal number 15.8, which talks about the need to manage the impact of invasive plants. So here we have a case where we are learning from the needs of a community in West Africa, in the country of Benin, in between Togo and Nigeria. In particular, we're interested in the region called Lake Nokwe, which is a major lake that has a great economic impact in the region, especially near the major city of Cotonou, which is right on the coast between the lake and the Atlantic Ocean. Now in this region, both in the lake but also in the nearby rivers, there's a long-term concern because there's a major plant which is invasive. It is not originally from this region, but it grows very fast. It's called the water hyacinth. And it has some beneficial properties, but because it grows so much in certain seasons, it can block the maneuvering of boats. And there are many people who depend on using human-powered boats to travel and do their activities for markets or to reach important locations for work and for home and education. So the water hyacinth can be a major concern. The company called Greenkeeper Africa is our collaborator, and we are thankful to have a grant funded by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and the Applied Sciences Program. And we are able to work with this team called Greenkeeper Africa to design a system to help monitor this plant from space. The company works with local uh, community members and they hire them to harvest the plant and they convert it into a product like this that you see that can absorb oil-based pollution and help clean up oil spills in the region due to vehicles or factory machines. So in that region, you have this company and they are a, becoming a well-established company there in Benin after about five years of work. And so you're working alongside them to create a system which will be an online observatory with data from satellites, drones, and water-based sensors. And our goal is to understand how this technology can be easily used so they can employ it as part of their day-to-day -day planning for when to harvest the water hyacinth and how to organize the community members who are doing the harvesting. In this case, we are drawing from a number of types of satellite data, in this case, especially from the United States and from Europe. So we benefit from the Landsat series of data, which has many years of data, but also the Sentinel data gives us both optical and radar imagery, which is very useful. To study the water hyacinth, we are looking at long-term data sets using Google Earth Engine, which gives us the chance to do a data analysis in a cloud-based platform. So instead of downloading large amounts of data from all the Sentinel and Landsat data in the past, we can ask Google Earth Engine to do analysis on their cloud computers and deliver the results. And this allows us to create uh, many months worth of data with a less uh, manual effort. And we can highlight through some data analysis techniques of identifying the seasonal patterns of the water hyacinth, we can understand in which periods we are seeing water hyacinth growing on the lake and local rivers. We're also exploring ways to use new commercial data to validate or to improve our understanding of the behavior of the plant. And of course, we spend time with local people understanding and validating this also right there on the ground. We're able to then make long-term histories over multiple decades showing how there's been actually an increase overall in the extent of the water hyacinth area coverage on the lake, uh, looking into the 90s and 2000s. And so we're trying to understand what's causing this overall increase. Of course, local scientists have studied how the water hyacinth growth is impacted by human activity and the level of nutrients in the water. Meanwhile, there's also human activity for fishing on the lake, and this also impacts water quality. And so we're also using data from drones and from radar satellites such as Sentinel-1 to understand uh, how there are fishing ponds built with local materials and how this activity of fishing both increases the opportunity for fish outcomes, but it also has some impact on the water quality. Uh, this is, you see an example of our collaborator and our student uh, working on flying drones locally there in Benin, both to monitor the growth of mangroves and to understand this use of uh, fishing ponds and how it impacts the water quality. Eventually, we will be able to combine all of this data from satellites, drones and water-based sensors, and the local team, Greenkeeper Africa, will be able to operate an online website that gives information that's publicly shared, 
showing the water quality and some of the inputs due to the water hyacinth plant, as well as the local fishing activities. And so we hope this information will help with the long-term process that the community is doing, where they are developing new methods for community-based water resource management. So in this case, we can highlight that we can use satellite earth observation data in collaboration with other data sets to effectively help teams and communities manage their own environment. Other examples uh, highlight how we use art. And I want to encourage everyone to remember, where were you uh, in July 2019? And how did you celebrate the anniversary of the Apollo landing? We were thinking both about the Apollo landing, but as well as the earlier images that we draw from Apollo, especially this image called Earthrise that comes from Apollo 8, as several astronauts were able to see a view of the Earth from space with this particular vantage point for the first time. And it brought many people to think about uh, what does it mean to think about sustainability on Earth, but from the space point of view. Many people were inspired to think a lot more about making an effort to protect the environment on Earth. So we wanted to draw from this, and several of my students and collaborators thought about how to create an experience that reminds people of this Earthrise image. So they designed this concept to invite people to sit on a bench as if you're on the moon looking back at the Earth. We pursued this and were invited by the Intrepid Museum of Sea, Air, and Space. They allowed us to come to the exhibit where they are hosting one of the retired space shuttles. And we created an exhibit where people could come into a dark room and literally sit on a bench. And you see us setting up the exhibit there. This is preparation because we're going to invite them to look at this uh, virtual Earth and see real satellite data. So we had about 400 people come through the exhibit that day. This is celebrating in July 2019 on the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And people were able to come in and look at the Earth with real satellite data showing imagery and ask themselves, if I could be on the moon looking back at the Earth, how would I feel differently about protecting our climate and our global community? So we also see that this kind of art practice can help us talk about the link between sustainability in Earth and in space. A few other projects will highlight how we're trying to impact international space policy. Space Enable is collaborating with teams of the World Economic Forum, the University of Texas at Austin, the European Space Agency, a company called Bryce Space and Technology. And we are designing a system to encourage operators of satellites to do everything they can to make their satellites more sustainable. We call this the Space Sustainability Rating. It'll be similar to other systems. As I showed earlier, we were very concerned about the long-term opportunities to operate in space because there's so much debris already and many more companies are planning to put a lot of new satellites in space, which is exciting for space services. But we think we need this rating to make sure that there is encouragement and awards for any organization that voluntarily says they will do their best to reduce space debris by how they choose their orbits, how they design their satellites, and how they ensure that they deorbit their satellites at the end of the mission. This is being discussed and coordinated until we respond to the long-term sustainability guidelines that have been presented and provided by the United Nations Committee on the peaceful use of outer space. I've also been able to recently present this activity and testify before Congress in the United States. And they are also uh, bringing together experts to talk about how we ensure that space will continue to be sustainable for operations by all countries in the future. It's a key issue and we're thankful for the chance to contribute. Another piece we can ask then, as there more, as more space activity in the future, uh, who will have the opportunity to participate, especially in academic microgravity research? This is Christine Joseph, one of the students has graduated in the past from Space Enabled. And she has done research to ask what will happen after the International Space Station has been changed and in the future into different modes of operation. We understand that the current collaborators will work on it for a number of years. And around the time of 2030, we'll have to ask what will be the new ways that different organizations are involved with space. There are a number of ways to do microgravity research. It can be done directly on the space station where you get the most access. But on Earth, there are also low-cost accesses. You can have access to a drop tower or a microgravity flight. And this can expand the opportunity for more countries to engage in microgravity research and bring their own unique research ideas. So Christine's work has been published, and she highlights both the variety of ways that countries around the world can access microgravity research, as well as the plans for new commercial and government actors who are proposing opportunities to create microgravity environments and perhaps commercially operated uh, space activity in the future. And we analyze how to ensure that it's open for participation by countries around the world, both economically as well as administratively, to ensure that there are not rules uh, that block the opportunities or that governments think about ways to subsidize the activities of universities that have fewer re resources. 
So this has been published by the IEEE, and you can see more examples of Christine's work online. Finally, I'll highlight the project that is the basis for our collaboration with Politecnico di Milano, and giving credit to a number of students and researchers that have worked together. As uh, Camila mentioned, we are asking the question, can we use wax, basic candle wax or beeswax, as a fuel for small satellites? We can give credit, of course, at first to say that there are a number of researchers in the United States, as well as around the world, that have been studying the use of fuel, uh, of wax, as a fuel for rockets. In particular, this was developed on Stanford University in the 1990s. We also see research on this even at Fosetno de Milano now. We want to take it now into space and see what is different when the fuel is used in orbit, in an environment with microgravity, and without the Earth's atmosphere. Now, currently, a lot of the fuels we use for satellites are quite dangerous for humans to handle. So one question we have is, how can we make a non-toxic fuel, where wax is something you can handle in your hand, it doesn't pose a risk to humans. Now, candle wax uh, is often drawn from a byproduct of oil refining. So in a sense, it's not the most uh, sustainable material. But we are also studying the use of beeswax, a naturally occurring product. And of course, we know there are many needs around the world to protect the survival of the bee communities. So we hope this will also contribute to showing the importance of bees, both for natural products as well as for products like potentially satellite fuel. Our colleagues have been drawing from past research, highlighting that it is possible to burn wax as a very efficient rocket fuel, but we want to see how it would change if you consider it uh, in a different environment where you're in microgravity and in a vacuum. So we are studying the question of how will paraffin wax and beeswax behave when they're melted and shaped into just the right shape to efficiently burn based on previous research. We want to compare laboratory experiments to experiments in vacuum chambers, to experiments on microgravity flights and rockets and planes, and eventually on the International Space Station. Our long-term vision is to do the kind of mission that I was explained earlier by Camila, explaining that we would like to see how this could behave on a full satellite mission. But first, we do a lot of stepping stones to get ready for that future mission. The key idea here is that the thermodynamics will change when you want to melt wax and cool it and get it into just the right shape. We were preparing for a future in which this could be done by a robotic mission, uh, actually on an automated way. And you could have an arbitrary amount of wax that you could melt and convert into a fuel grain as needed. But we need to understand first the role of thermodynamics and how the convection and radiation will change depending on if you're in the laboratory, a thermal vacuum chamber, the International Space Station, or fully in orbit. Because in each case, you'll have a different kind of heat transfer between the wax and the surrounding environment. So we are studying this in our lab. We're doing experiments with melted wax. Here you see an example where it looks like water, but it's actually liquid wax and we're spinning it just as you would if you're going to operate it and use the wax as a fuel grain. The idea here is to get this very nice shape where in the middle you have actually an empty column of air and that is the most efficient shape to burning the wax. And so we've had a chance to do several experiments and see results where we're understanding how long it takes for the melted wax to cool. And this is in the case where we're in one atmosphere and one gravity on Earth. So we wanna be able to compare these results results in a microgravity environment on a plane and future on the space station. And then we can compare that to the simulations that Camila's team has done so we can understand how it might work on a satellite mission that we hope to also do in the future. This data set uh, looks very simple, but actually it's giving us a better understanding of what we should expect uh, due to the kind of thermal experience you have, whether it's on a lab or on the space station. Meanwhile, the best way for us to get microgravity access has been uh, to interact with companies that offer uh, flights on microgravity planes. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the opportunities to take a research flight where you can pay to go on a commercial flight, whether it's in the US or other countries. And the flight takes a very steep uh, path in the sky. And it gives you about 20 seconds of microgravity experience as the plane goes over the top of a virtual hill in the air. So our colleague, Dr. Javier Stober, has been leading a team of students and researchers, and they've been developing experiments to go onto these microgravity flights. Here you see Christine Joseph, who I earlier introduced as a researcher, uh, also uh, flying with one of our payloads. And we want to give thanks to the uh, United Arab Emirates Space Agency that allowed us to fly as a guest that day on their microgravity flight with the Zero G Corporation. Here's an example of Christine uh, having the chance to float for a few seconds. And there you see our research experiment, wondering how this uh, wax experiment will behave differently because it is in one atmosphere, but it's in the microgravity environment and we expect that the thermodynamics will be different. And we'll get a slightly different opportunity to see the rate of cooling and of 
solidification for this wax. And to give you a close-up on the view, here you see not wax itself, but a simulation for wax, uh, which has very similar density and behavior. And we're seeing we do get that very nice uh, center in the middle where you have an empty column of air and it's forming the right shape for what we expect to see. And we think we can get perhaps less energy required in the microgravity environment compared to the environment on Earth. Uh, another of our colleagues named Juliet Wanyiri, who's about to graduate with her master's degree from MIT, also had a chance to fly and do this next iteration of research. So we're getting promising results from the microgravity planes. And we hope to continue this and do it eventually, as we mentioned, on the space station and eventually in an orbital mission in, in multiple years. But we're so thankful for the collaboration, especially coming from Politecnico di Milano, which is helping us understand if our experimental results can match our theoretical understanding for how it would work for a space mission in the future. With that, I'm very happy to stop the formal discussion and look forward to hearing questions and dialogue with the audience. And thank you so much to the team from Polyme for joining us today. Thank you. Professor Wood, Daniela, thank you so much for that presentation and for bringing your colleagues from Milan and showing us the importance of international cooperation. I wanted to ask you to speak on that a little bit. I mean, why is it so important to have this international collaboration rather than individual countries in this race for space, you know, the race to have the research and the inventions first? Thank you so much for asking about the importance of international collaboration in space. I think that sometimes people who are outside the space community may get the impression that countries around the world are racing and trying to beat each other in space and are not interested in collaborating. But actually, if we look at the history of the space community, it's really been quite the opposite uh, for a lot of our activities. It's great that I mentioned the work by Christine Joseph, and she has uh, been studying also the history of how we've come to the current state of microgravity opportunities for research through the International Space Station. It highlights that even though people often uh, re reference that there was a race to the moon and that it created a sense of division among different countries in space, so much of what we do in space has really been depending on each other across different countries. Uh, we can look at the experience of the International Space Station, which is one of the greatest examples where there's really a treaty between you know, five parties, uh, teams from Europe, uh, Canada, Japan, Russia, and the United States, and they must work so closely together and really their lives and their safety depend on each other. But of course, there are also so many scientific research mission, missions. I used to work for NASA and their uh, scientific community uh, they work on, on the order of about 100 science missions all around the solar system, but most of them are not done by one country. When we think about doing an important scientific mission to study a planet like Saturn or Mercury, we tend to ask, how can multiple countries contribute with different instruments and scientific analysis? Partly because there's so few opportunities to send satellites to these distant places, and partly because there's science information all around the world. My research has also explored how countries in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia have been getting more and more involved with space. Right now, their activities uh, with space agencies or formal use of satellite technology in many countries around the world, there are probably on the order of 80 or so space agencies, and many countries have had their own satellite projects. They want to train local engineers to understand how they can design and operate satellites, especially for Earth observation and communication. And of course, they want to collaborate with other countries that are also very active. So in every region of the world, you see countries investing in space activity, but looking at an opportunity for scientific collaboration or for applications to make sure we have satellite data during times of disaster and to make sure we are able to respond and use all of our tools, especially in times like this when we need a collaboration around the world, even to address topics like the global pandemic. Great, thank you. We have a couple questions here from our, our viewers. Athos Bernabai asks, um, he said he would like to know, he would like to tell you, first of all, his dream is working as aerospace engineer in the propulsion field, in particular with alternative propulsion methods such as solar sails. He said he'll soon have to choose his university path, but he's really worried about the costs of, I guess, with having to get so many advanced degrees. And how can you, how can you manage that and still pursue your dream? Thank you so much for sharing. I wish you all the best, and I do encourage you to pursue your vision. We definitely need to explore new questions for how to have propulsion for systems in space. There are still many questions that have not been answered, and we need all the interested people to do their best to join. 
Now, it's true that education can be an important question, and you want to ask how can you afford both the time and the money, and of course, the situations where you're dedicating your time to education rather than other important areas in your life, like supporting and taking care of your family. I have certainly invested a lot in education in my experience. I studied basically for 12 years for my undergrad. I studied for two master's degrees and a PhD. I was very fortunate to have a lot of support and to pursue opportunities for funding, in this case from the United States government. So I'm very thankful for that. I had fellowships for my graduate studies, both from NASA, from our US National Science Foundation, as well as from the Department of Defense in the United States. So I've benefited greatly from government programs that allow students to apply for grants uh, for our research. I also found many opportunities to collaborate. One thing that was true for me, I was able to treat my graduate school experience like a job. So I was able to uh, be in programs that provide some funding for the students, but also allow the students the opportunity to build their professional experience. So while I was a graduate student, I also did internships with NASA and the United Nations, and I continued to develop my professional network. So I don't feel that I had to wait to really start my work. But I think certainly it's a very personal decision to see what the best path, the best path is for you. But I do encourage you to explore uh, the universities in your country uh, and around the world because there are certainly interesting technical questions to ask about the future of propulsion in space. Thanks. Great. A couple more questions here. Sylvia uh, Ciccarelli asks, in your opinion, which field of space will provide or is providing higher benefits for society also in terms of investments and return on investment. Thank you so much. It's a great opportunity to highlight that we are in a period of major changes in the space industry and economics. So I mentioned six technologies earlier and I'll give some examples of how they are changing and how they'll offer new benefits in the future. I gave several examples today of satellite earth observation, but also applications that depend on satellite based positioning and timing. In many cases, we need to combine several systems from satellites to get the best benefit. Now, many of us don't even notice, but these are tools that are part of our daily life, especially when we are using information from our phones, which might have a map that's using satellite-based positioning and may be referencing satellite-based imagery in our maps as well. So there are many economic activities, including delivery services and navigation systems that help planes and other forms of transportation that are already using satellite technology in a way that's sort of hidden from the public, but it's vital to the infrastructure. So in that way, we could say that satellite positioning and earth observation and communications are already vital infrastructure within our economy. Now on the communication side, we're seeing new business models emerging. In the past, most satellite communication systems have been based at what's called the geostationary orbit, which is about 36,000 kilometers coming out of the equator, and it's quite distant. So you do get some delay if you're doing a phone call live uh, on a phone call that's sent through a geostationary satellite. And there are companies, a number of them, that are proposing to put a large number of smaller and simpler communication satellites, in what we call low Earth orbit, which is much closer to the Earth, more like uh, maybe uh, 800 to 1200 kilometers away. For this, they need many more satellites. And that's why we're seeing a lot of proposals to put a large number of satellites in space. It may bring lower costs for communications, for internet access, for phone calls, for areas that are less connected. And we also want to see how will technologies, this phrase called internet of things, the idea that there could be many uh, systems that are actually connected to the internet, but they're hardware systems. And they are for environmental monitoring. They are the systems that we use uh, to keep our infrastructure going. They may also be able to link to these satellite networks. So we're actually expecting to see a lot of new ideas for how to use these systems. Plus, there are teams that are proposing to put companies in space that could be doing manufacturing or providing services for commercial or tourist activities in low Earth orbit and the area between about 400 and, and 2,000 kilometers above the Earth. And there may be new activities we've never seen, uh, ways to make money or provide new research activity. So we, in fact, I think over the next few years, we'll see a lot of new activities that have not been tried but are feasible now because of more opportunities for launch and new technology capabilities. So in fact, people can bring their new ideas to this and think about how they can start a business in space in the coming years. Microphone, Marlene. Grazie. <laughs> 
Roberta Loreto asks, in addition to environmental monitoring, other space applications can facilitate daily life during and after COVID time? Thank you so much for asking about how we can use knowledge from space to support our activities in response to COVID. Of course, you know, we are responding now and finding creative ways to keep moving even while our world has changed so much. Our team has been exploring ways to use information from satellite Earth observation to contribute to countries' decision-making during COVID. And so we are asking how we can use monitoring uh, from satellites to understand changes in air quality and water quality and human activity, which are results of social distancing. And so we are talking to several countries to ask if this data and this technique could be useful to them. But I think it's a great question to ask, what's the broader set of tools we can draw from space research that support COVID? One broader theme is that we learned a lot about people living in enclosed environments uh, from our space experiences. I think there are actually a number of astronauts who have had a chance to speak lately about how they've experienced social distancing because it's normal for astronauts to be quarantined before the flight. And of course, if you're living on the International Space Station, you're in a small location about the size of maybe a house in terms of the internal volume. And you're with a small group of people and you have to stay with them and solve problems together and learn to get along. So I think what some of us are experiencing staying home right now is actually similar to a space mission. And in a way, we all need to learn how to do this for future space missions as well as for our current situation. Meanwhile, there are questions of you know, how to ensure that we are using uh, limited medical resources in the best way possible. This is also an area of research uh, for future space missions, but of course it's vital right now. Of course, there's also the topic of telemedicine to ask you know, how can we better provide needs uh, for people who are not experiencing COVID but still need medical care, whether it's psychological and mental health support, or whether it's uh, telemedicine for other kinds of needs that are more routine. So I think there's a lot of experimentation happening now in telemedicine, and that's also an area of active research for space. So of course, there are a number of questions they want to ask, how can we better serve people from different backgrounds, especially those uh, who have low economic opportunity and who are already uh, experiencing great concern due to COVID? And how can our knowledge from space experience, studying social distancing, studying uh, how to keep people safe and healthy through a quarantine process, studying how to use limited resources in effective ways, and also studying telemedicine, all of those can be transferred, I think, to this time. Okay, we've had a couple of questions about how space um, research can somehow affect viruses and pandemics, and I think you've answered that pretty well. Is there anything else you wanted to add on that? I think that's all for now. Just to say, of course, if people have ideas uh, that are more on the side of uh, the public health side and the medical side, it's not my expertise, but I have been thankful lately to collaborate with uh, people who are studying public health and trying to see how our work can be combined with theirs. But it's an area that I, I'm not so well to speak on personally. Okay, we have a question from Joe Moda, and she or he would like to know if there is any program or collaboration with Brazil. Thank you so much for the question. I hope that perhaps you are from Brazil or based there. And yes, uh, I've been thankful for the opportunity uh, to build relationships in Brazil. In particular, I want to give credit uh, to the city government of Rio de Janeiro. And they have a team that focuses on knowledge management. It's called IPP. And they have great expertise in the area of building maps using geospatial data, which is you know, located by satellite positioning, as well as using Earth observation. So for the last few years, one of my students named Jack Reed has been working closely in collaboration with the city government of Rio, as well as with people from the university, which is a federal university of Rio de Janeiro. In particular, we are studying topics related to the care and management of mangrove forest, especially in communities that typically have lower incomes and depend on the mangrove health as part of their fishing activities for their economic growth. We're asking questions around what city policies are being used to help protect the mangroves? And then how does that affect the livelihood and opportunities for local communities? So our goal is to create a system that will have satellite data as well as socioeconomic data and data around how the government policies are implemented for mangrove conservation. And eventually the system can be used by government decision makers as well as by community members to explore what policies are going to be best uh, used and what uh, kind of changes they hope to manage within the mangrove forest. For those who are not familiar, mangroves are an amazing set of trees that grow all around the world near the equator. 
and they have special features that their roots tend to come right up out of the water uh, and there are unique fish and other animals that usually live and grow in these roots. They create a natural nursery uh, for a small animal life. And they often play a key role in the economic health of a community, but they're also uh, often deforested because their wood is useful for many things. So there's always a question of how to best maintain the mangroves while also enab enabling economic activity. So we're doing this kind of work in collaboration with a team from NASA Goddard, who gives us techniques on how to best analyze the satellite data to monitor the mangroves in space. And they've done work like this actually around the world near the equator where you have mangroves growing. But yes, we are so thankful for our collaboration in Brazil. Oh, it's amazing. I, I probably couldn't ask any country and you would be able to talk about collaboration. <laughs> I um, Roberto, a lot on uh, Latin America and the Caribbean as well as uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but we also collaborate with other folks and I've had a chance to learn a lot from Southeast Asia as well, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand in the past. So we enjoy many regions of the world. And do you get to travel to all of those regions when you do your research or is this done, um, you know, through Zoom like we're doing today? That is an excellent question. I would say until March 2020, I was traveling a lot. In fact, for March and April, I had planned to travel to Chile, to Europe, as, as well as um, be able to interact with colleagues in, in parts of Africa and, and as well as in Southeast Asia. Of course, a lot of travel has been canceled right now, and I don't expect to leave my house for the next while. So right now, we have been finding new ways. Uh, this week, I've been on calls with colleagues in Ghana, in Benin, next week with Indonesia. We'll talk to our colleagues in Chile and Brazil again soon. So yes, we are basically innovating new ways to collaborate uh, using connections like this. And it has been challenging, but I think we are finding ways to continue to make good progress. Good, so we're all in the same boat. <laughs> um, Roberto Loreto has another question. She says, what can we learn from space, from the space experience to redesign socio-technical systems for humans on Earth? Now that is an excellent question, and I feel that I, uh, it's a question I'm so glad that you asked. Now, there's a couple points to consider. Actually, one of our students in the team is doing his doctoral thesis really with that question in mind. One question is, what can we learn from looking at history? I teach a class in the fall semester, so September to December each year. And I ask the students in my team who are studying space designs to first look at important aspects of our Earth history to understand how we came to the current state. Our world is highly affected by global wealth inequality. We have such an extreme difference between the people who live with the least amount of money and wealth and those who live with the most. And we know that uh, this is not by accident. It's because there's been conscious choices by people who had strong power and technology. During the period from the 1400s till today, we've established a global economy. In the 1400s, it started with the Portuguese uh, focusing on using their boats to do a, a transatlantic slave trade that grew to, to many other countries. And of course, you have a period in the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s of colonization in the Americas, especially in Central and South America, that later moves to colonization more so in Africa and Southeast Asia. And the behavior that we created during this time, which included uh, slavery, and really exploitative practices. It meant that we have some countries that have more opportunity for technology development and economic development and other countries where their opportunities were really limited during this period of colonization. Now today, of course, we have quite a different setting, but the economic activities are still responding to these traditions. So we look at the, the sustainable development goals, and I would argue that the only reason we need them is because we've had so many years of uh, unequal exchange in economic activity between different countries. So the next question is, uh, what can we do today on Earth and how can we learn more ideas for space? Now, if we look at our space activities right now, according to international space law, the way we think about how we do work in space is driven by country law. So even if you go to space, you're still under the call of a certain country. But eventually we might have communities that live on the moon or Mars and create their own local uh, sort of ways of living. I think it does give us a fresh opportunity to explore how to create a just society. And a student in our team named David Colby Reed is doing his PhD to ask how can we look at issues from law and from social justice and philosophy and design a society that would be perhaps even more just and fair to different people living together in a place like the Mars or Moon. Then we can ask uh, what can we do today to change our assumptions? I think we really need to think about sustainability in an integrated way that considers environmental justice, social justice, and economic justice. And we know that the communities uh, that are indigenous as well as those that have experienced long-term either racial or religious discrimination 
countries from small island nations, countries in the Arctic, those who are experiencing the effects of climate change now, they are some of those who are most uh, experiencing risk uh, due to both climate change and economic challenges. So I think we should really listen to those communities first and ask, what can we change to make the global economic system more fair for them? Okay, Thank you for the I question. think we have time for one more question because we started a little late. Um, Impresario asks, in which sectors is the impact of machine learning and artificial intelligence more beneficial in the next steps of economic development in the Earth Moon system? Thank you so much for the question. It certainly is a period in which machine learning and artificial intelligence are expanding from being more you know, areas of theoretical research to really being applied in many areas of our life. We can highlight that part of it is an economic as well as an ethical challenge. When people uh, bring in new approaches for machine learning, they can sometimes use data in a way that makes it confusing for people how decisions are being made. So we want to think about part of our questions, how do we ensure ethical processes? So if you use machine learning to categorize data, for example, you might be uh, one of our colleagues is an expert in artificial intelligence. He's a graduate student in our team, and he's developing tools that draw from machine learning to help farmers in India think about the health of their crops. And we can use machine learning to help organize large data sets from satellites or other sources and try to understand regions that are affected strongly uh, by natural disasters or by concerns that the markets uh, where farmers are selling uh, to make sure that the prices are fair to farmers. So there's great opportunities, but of course, when you start to bring in machine learning, it means you put an algorithm on some data and then you say, here's the results. And that can sometimes mean that people who use the results don't understand everything about what was done uh, with the algorithm. Now, of course, you asked about upcoming changes. As I mentioned earlier, I think we will see a lot of new business ideas uh, in or in space. So there'll be companies that start new activities uh, with businesses, uh, both in orbit around the Earth, potentially on the moon, people are thinking about mining for asteroids. It's all very exciting, and I think we will need uh, new forms of artificial intelligence to operate, um, both to get information about what's going on, to understand the state of our systems, and of course, it's a question of uh, how will robots play a role? This is an open question that many people around the world are exploring. Will we have you know, humans operating all these facilities, or will there be uh, some level of autonomy? And of course, we could speak longer about different kinds of autonomy, whether it's uh, a fully uh, a system that can make all decisions by itself, or what's one that humans are reviewing. But I certainly think there's room for innovations in robotics and in understanding how to look at large data sets using artificial intelligence. And I think as we try to do new challenging things in orbit around the Earth and on the Moon and Mars, uh, certainly we'll be using artificial intelligence as a key tool. Thank you for the question. So I just wanted to ask you, because so many of our viewers always want to know, how does someone like you become you? I mean, did something spark your interest as a child? Was there some point in your life where you said, this is what I'm going to do? Thank you for asking. And I really want to answer to say, I encourage people around the world uh, to do what you love the most. <laughs> Meaning I'm in this place now because I was dedicated to figuring out how to get a job doing what I actually like. I'm very fortunate. I mentioned, of course, that I had a lot of support from the US government for my graduate education. And I was thankful that when I was in high school and secondary school, a teacher and uh, the counselors at my school encouraged me to apply to an internship with NASA at Kennedy Space Center which is one of the most inspiring places in the world. I was fortunate to be actually at Kennedy Space Center at age 17 and watching materials that were being prepared to launch the space station, including the United States Laboratory, which is now a you know, national lab on the space station. And I was even able to be on calls with teams in Italy because in fact, my team that I worked on was the space station logistics team. And we were coordinating closely with the Italian space agency and they were thinking about the role of Italy in providing the multi-purpose logistics module. So my first experience with space was exploring how this team in Florida was coordinating with people in Italy to make sure the engineering happened successfully to get to the space station. So I think I was immediately drawn to the love of international collaboration and the challenging problems that we work on in space. And after that, I had to ask, how can I also connect with my interest in development and a social just world and to see if I could work on those two things together. It took me about a decade and thanks to a lot of mentors, I was able to find a path. Super. Uh, I think we're out of questions. And I really wanted to say thank you so much, first of all, for joining us today, for bringing us all of this information, letting us know about the international collaboration, and even showing us with your team, bringing your team here today was just super. 
And we're really happy to see that you're collaborating in Milan after coming here for some programs and some studies. And thank you so much for continuing. Um, Francesco, did you want to say a couple words before we close? Uh, just a word. Uh, um, it has been a really interesting uh, relation uh, lectured uh, by the uh, Professor Daniel Wood. Really, really interesting. And uh, uh, the, the various several uh, questions about uh, uh, array in uh, relation is a witness of uh, is uh, important uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, items uh, in uh, inside. Uh, per il resto, devo dire, scusandomi per l'inglese, sempre un po' uh, così, uh, che avremo il prossimo appuntamento la settimana prossima, sempre di giovedì alle 15, dobbiamo ancora definire l'ospite, e continueremo in collaborazione con Marlene Nice e il suo staff a proporvi eh, una volta in italiano, una volta in inglese, relatori che spero continuino a avere e a suscitare questo interesse perché le domande sono tante e non sempre riusciamo a farle fare tutte. Marlene Nice, thank you very much for this uh, new uh, appointment. Rendezvous with you. Thank you everyone. Thank you Professor Wood, Francesco. Thanks to our viewers who seem to keep coming back. We're happy to see you. And la prossima settimana parlerò in italiano, forse. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.